it's in progress and the webinar has officially started. So that's good. And sharing my screen. And people are slowly arriving because I can see the participant number climbing, which eh, is what I've learned now after three events. So it's beginning to catch on this webinar hosting event um, thing that I've been doing. Um, so it's nice to see that number climb and welcome as you roll in and uh, join us um, for this third session in this three part series on demolition, deconstruction and displacement. Um, these conversations represent a form of critical reflection, not only for the heritage discourse, um, but a broader, uh, but broader conversations within architecture, urbanism and landscape studies. Through these dis uh, discussions, we are exploring not only the physical accumulations of buildings, but also the materials and geographies they generate. For those who attended uh, the first two, they will understand that uh, this event is a substitute of sorts uh, for the ACO Toronto's annual symposium, which is usually a one day and in-person affair. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has joined the session tonight. Despite um, the beautiful weather outside and the Zoom fatigue, um, both which loom large and are worthy distractions. So in spite of these forces, um, this webinar format enables us to welcome attendees and panelists from far and wide. Um, and for the first time in the series, all of our panelists are uh, broadcasting from more or less closer to the Toronto region. Um, so wherever you are, thank you and welcome. Um, my name is Alison Kriba. I have a small practice called Local Technique, which operates at the intersection of architectural conservation and waste and explores possible futures and entangled pasts of sites, structures, and materials. And I do this in multiple ways, um, including instances like this, where I host, I just happen to host a panel discussion <laughs> on uh, themes that I think are relevant and interesting. Um, and I'm very happy for the opportunity um, from ACO Toronto to do that. So to give you a little more context uh, for ACO Toronto, L, um, is Matt Zambri, uh, the president of the organization. Thank you, Allison. So I just want to say thank you to everyone who's attended now for um, the journey of uh, demolition, uh, deconstruction and displacement. So we're on our final final panel um, discussion this evening. Um, these discussions are brought um, or are made possible by our members. So I want to thank our members. And if you're not a member, I would um, encourage you to maybe check us out and join us as we advocate for heritage conservation in Toronto. Um, I hope that everyone enjoys the discussions today. Um, I'm, I can't wait to sit back and listen. Um, and I, I wanna thank our guest speakers tonight for making it out and, and wanting to bring their research forward. Uh, can't wait to see what you guys bring. So with that, I'm gonna say have a good evening and enjoy yourselves. Bye everybody. Thanks, Matt. Um, so before we begin, just uh, a few comments on the format. Um, as I mentioned, this is a webinar, which means that as audience members, you can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, this event is being recorded um, and will be made available on YouTube um, later. And all questions and comments can be submitted in the chat. Um, it will be monitored by my lovely assistant, Juliet Cook, um, uh, who will review the questions um, at the sort of latter section of the event. So before we begin, begin, um, I wanna start with a thought experiment. I want you to picture the structure that you're currently inhabiting and deconstruct that structure in your mind to picture each of the materials, the wooden studs, 
the gypsum filled drywall, perhaps the laminate flooring, the glass windows, the brick, the asphalt. Now imagine the trucks, the trains, the ships that transported these items from their sites of manufacturing. Then picture all of the modes of transportation that in turn ship those materials um, to processing from their sites of extraction. Follow these things in your mind as they tentacle outwards through a sequence of sites and as they are manipulated and change form. Do this until you arrive at the land before the materials are mined and displaced. Extracted and indeed displaced from the land, this is an important visualization and an important way to start this discussion on displacement um, and to also recognize the history of colonization of both material and cultural displacement, which provides the foundation for this meeting today. So uh, we'd like to acknowledge and thank the generations of peoples who stewarded this land before being displaced and continue to do so from Toronto to Toronto. Um, these are the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And it remains home to these and many more diverse First Nations, um, including the Inuit and Métis people. So we acknowledge and are grateful for this stewardship and um, grateful to share this space and bring you this event tonight. Um, as a mode of introduction, today's discussion on displacement both builds and dismantles the two previous topics covered in this series, demolition and deconstruction. In the first session, we heard from Jeff Biles about the history of demolition trade in North America and the evolution of the tools used. Through Francesca Russello Amon, we learned how demolition drew lines along social and economic divides and was promoted not only through municipal policies, but as she calls it, a broader culture of clearance where the bulldozer permeated lifestyle magazines and children's books as a marker of progress. Jordan Tepperman, fifth generation in uh, one of Toronto's oldest demolition companies, shared a perspective rarely heard amongst the heritage crowds and told an entirely different story of progress. One about a growing family, business and trade. Demolition in Toronto, he suggested, is rarely an indicator of a building's diminished value, but illustrates instead the increasing value of the land on which it stands. We learned that demolition and deconstruction were at one time very similar processes, where up until the mid-century of this past century, um, buildings were often stripped and parts sold in order to subsidize the work itself. Now often discussed as an alternative to demolition, the second panel on that uh, was on that was on the topic of deconstruction. Um, Susan Ross introduced this um, this process as a conservation treatment type that tethers places together by reconfiguring materials from one site in another. She also drew our attention to the value of the in-between sites the salvage yards, shops, and storage sheds, which enable the transformation, these transformation of values to take place. Connecting building materials with the ancient reserves in which they are retrieved, Adam Corneal presented deconstruction as an important environmental and economic industry, pivotal in combating the destruction of our environmental heritage. Offering statistics, he suggested that deconstruction has the potential to not only divert the over 4 million tons of waste generated annually by the construction and demolition industry, um, as well, um, and in turn, the approximately 20, uh, 20 million tons of CO2 released as a result, um, not to mention uh, reducing the demand for virgin lumber. Dr. Hazel Denhart, told the story of salvage in post-Katrina New Orleans, where the deconstruction of homes in the Ninth Ward offered residents an alternative to the mandatory demolition um, um, of their homes, which were destroyed by the storm. 
but it also it offered a sense of empowerment, closure, and grieving amidst the immediate and historic tra trauma, which was compounded by the event. And finally, Dr. Andrew Judge spoke again of another form of unbuilding, of deconstruction as an anti-colonial act, of dismantling expectations of how and, 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 and how things are supposed to function, a way of returning dignity to the death of buildings, um, and also by establishing respect for the origins and continued capacities that their components um, continue to enact. So while the heritage discourse often focuses on the loss of structures and community and the communities which inhabit them, these conversations on demolition and deconstruction laid the groundwork for a broader discussion in tonight's um, um, event on displacement. As a culmination of these topics, tonight's panel will offer three additional perspectives, or multiple actually, maybe five additional perspectives um, on material and cultural displacement in the unbuilt form. Together, we aim to investigate um, not only what is destroyed, but what is created through these processes. In doing so, we ask many things. Where do displaced materials and communities go? And what do they do when they get there? How do modes of transportation and interstitial geographies affect and, trans and transform the displaced materials and actors? How do shifting attitudes about health and safety and economics of space influence displacement? How do displaced elements become entangled in deeper cultural architectures and evolving landscapes? What are the conditions which link recipient sites what if all do these geographies have in common? It is my hope that in asking these questions, tonight's event will offer yet another view on the unintentional design of these places and the often unseen heritage which defines our legacy. And I'm happy now to introduce um, this evening's panelists who will share a range of perspectives on this topic. Um, I'll be introducing them in the order in which they will present, um, and um, each presenter will offer a, a roughly 15-minute presentation, and uh, we'll uh, follow that with a, with a discussion amongst ourselves um, for about 15 minutes, um, followed by uh, questions from the audience, which can be submitted in the chat. So without further ado, uh, Heidi Schopp is the built and um, the built and landscape heritage team lead in Woods Cultural Heritage Group. She has worked in the field of cultural resource management since 2011 and is a professional member of the Canadian Association of Heritage Professionals. Jenny Foster is a professor in the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change at York University. She studies urban ecology, environmental aesthetics, habitat creation, and environmental justice. Together, they have collaborated on multiple projects exploring, exploring the creation and evolution of Toronto's Leslie Street Spit, a five kilometer peninsula made of displaced building matter. Ron Ma and Lena Sans Tovar are a team of students working there we go. Um, working with Toronto's Regent Park communities to tell stories of its history and redevelopment and the lives of its residents. Lena recently completed her master's degree in planning at the University of Toronto, where she wrote her thesis on media representations of displacement and social mixing in two prominent um, development projects in the city, those being Regent Park and Mervish Village. And Ron has a degree in urban studies and cinema studies and works at the intersections of visual culture and political geography through multi multiple interdisciplinary film projects. And finally, Michelle Murphy is a science and technology studies scholar and historian whose work focuses on environmental and, just, and reproductive justice, data politics, chemical exposures, infrastructures, indigenous science and technology studies, race and colonialism. Murphy is a professor in the history department and women and gender studies institute at the University of Toronto and holds a tier one Canada research chair 
in science and technology studies. So thank you. Um, and without further ado, I will pass it on to Heidi and Jenny. Thank you so much, Allison. And Heidi, can you bring up the slide? Yeah. yeah. Okay, can you see? Fantastic, thank you. Sorry. So we've organized, thanks so much for inviting us, for including us. The panel sounds amazing, as do the last two that preceded this one. And um, yeah, it's such an honor to be here today with everybody. Um, Heidi and I are gonna talk about the Leslie Street Spit. And we've organized our presentation so that we'll just take turns talking. Every few minutes, we'll switch back and forth. Um, we're gonna talk about the Leslie Street Spit, which many of you probably already know and are familiar with. I'm gonna start with an introduction to the Leslie Street Spit, or we both are, then I'm gonna um, begin a theorization of the idea of displacement in relation to spaces like this. And we're gonna um, head into a third section that's on physical and cultural displacement and what that means in relation to places like the Leslie Street Spit. So we'll begin with the introduction. For those who haven't been there, I suggest you take, a, take the time to go and visit. It's a, a, a verdant wonder, an ecological marvel. Um, if you haven't been there, it's five kilometers long. It's a construction waste dump that stretches out from the heart of Toronto into the Lake Ontario, due south, straight out of Lake Ontario. The Leslie Street Spit is a really young landform. It was initiated only in 1959 as a place, again, to dump construction waste. And dumping continued until only just over a year ago. So there were dump trucks coming in every day, in and out, um, up until about a year ago. Today it's celebrated as a sort of feral green space that sprung from spontaneous invasion. So species invasion is what we have to thank for what we find today at the Leslie Street Spit. It's now Tommy Thompson Park, a, a, a huge park in the um, coming out of central Toronto. There's an astounding array of flora and fauna at the spit and it's abundant wildlife. Um, there's mature forests, there are wetlands, a beautiful shoreline, a stunning view of the city if you head out there at sunset. It's a provincially environmentally significant area, an ESA, and in the year 2000 it was declared as globally significant, uh, sorry, a globally significant bird er area by BirdLife International. So for ma in many ways, the Leslie Street Spit is the counterpoint to the ecologically destructive effects of contemporary urban development. In the early days when it was a bare dump that was devoid of any ecological systems, birds migrated back and forth across Lake Ontario. And the Leslie Street Spit was the first thing or the last thing that they would see. It was a prominent launch point and a prominent landing spot as they returned from south. Their droppings would add seeds and that gradually built into surface biomass. Eventually these birds started nesting and breeding and the cycle of ecological succession was set in motion. I'll, you can see here the story of ringbill gulls and how quickly their populations exploded on the Leslie Street Spit, but there are so many notable bird, bird colonies that you can find here. There's herring gulls, common terns, huge colonies of each, double crested cormorants, once endangered in Ontario. There's black, black crown night herons. There's uh, songbirds all over the place. If you go right now, you, the place is just humming with songbirds. So there's a really impressive concentration of bird habitats. And especially this would be impressive for any major city, but it's even more so considering the site's location in the city's central industrial heart. What we find is a tight layering of nesting colonies that, was, um, that are like three pieces of a three-dimensional puzzle that create, eco uh, create ecologically unique community structures. So we have trees, uh, we have bird colonies nesting at the canopy, at the upper layers, in the mid layers, low down in the trees, and then on the ground, all one on top of each other. What's truly striking is that this ecological jewel evolved in the midst of persistent industrial activity as well. It wasn't afterwards or in the wake. 
I'll turn over to um, Heidi so she can give us uh, a little bit more information about the Leslie Street Spit. Uh, this is a just an overview map of the Leslie Street Spit. And as Jenny mentioned, dumping started here in 1959. And you can sort of see the yearly divisions that we've mapped out. Um, so sort of year by year, um, more rubble and waste from the city would come and be dumped here. And they built this landscape according to a plan developed by the TRCA. Um, it's a continually involve, evolving landscape, as Jenny mentioned. Um, it was only last year where dumping stopped. Um, but what I think is really interesting from a cultural heritage perspective is that in many ways, it's the built form or the built heritage of the city that has been demolished and has in effect created a cultural heritage landscape. So from a heritage perspective, you know, the, there's this 40 year threshold, which is where we start to consider properties, either buildings or landscapes, where we start to consider if they might have heritage value. So that brings us to 1981. So this started in 1959. So we're clearly over that threshold. So I think in many ways, this is a, a designed landscape. It's built from the rubble of the city and it's also created a very special place that I think has cultural meaning in addition to ecological meaning as Jenny has outlined. Um, here's uh, the evolution of the spit on some aerial photographs. So you can see a little bit better how this evolves, just not one static photograph. So we have 1957, it's just the natural, or at least the industrial shoreline rather. Um, 1964, you can start to see the waste coming in. Between 64 and 68, there is considerable demolition going on in the city um, that can be tied to certain neighborhoods and initiatives related to planning. And we'll get into that a little bit later and you can just see the explosion of this landscape. And then finally, by the 1980s, the general form is there. Um, I think it's just fascinating. I love doing um, map progressions and historical photo progressions because I think you can just see the change so clearly. So back to Jenny. So one way to think about this is in relation to the concept of creative destruction. And I'll take a moment to, to just discuss creative destruction here. The Leslie Street spit is really interesting because it and it I believe really animates the dynamics of creative destruction as a core process in the formation of contemporary cities. It's an economic principle that refers to the process of incessantly dismantling old systems to create new ones. The concept of, was identified by Joseph Schumpeter as the basis of capitalism itself as essential to economic growth. It's an entrepreneurial process of creating new by destroying old. And although the theory focuses on economic structures, it can also be traced through the built environment in relation to urban change itself. So in this way, I'm proposing that we think of uh, creative destruction as the material expression of, the, of um, what could be called a spatial fix. When the capabilities of buildings to function as economic assets become unsatisfactory for wealth accumulation, what we find is the destruction that destruction presents new opportunities to absorb surplus capital and to increase production and to expand profits. So in short, the, so the cycle would look something like this. First, we see the extraction of the materials and all the labor that's required to do that. Then that we see the production of the building materials like bricks or blocks or cement that turn into the creation of urban form through buildings, facilities, infrastructure, all of that. Once this urban form is saturated with buildings that no longer serve economic growth, what we find is um, this coincides with aging infrastructure as well and the lack of investment in these buildings. These urban forms are rendered then as waste and they're demolished in favor of modernist reconstruction. Then the whole cycle begins anew. So this also coincides with other do dominant tra trajectories of Western urbanism. For example, deindustrialization and the shift away from primary production as a, as, towards the service industries. So investment in information technologies and the preoccupation with creative class investments like large scale science and technology, medicine, medical research and care, universities, performing arts facilities and museums, stadiums, arenas, and of course, tourism. In short, it's part of an overall move to produce what can be called world-class cities, 
So it's important to note that these new investments are not just in the buildings and the structures, but also in green spaces that make the cities competitive and attractive for people who are willing to participate in the creative class transformations. It's no secret that reclaimed green spaces really heat up real estate markets and transform entire neighborhoods. A lot of this is, is drawn from um, David Harvey's Justice, Nature and the Geography of Difference, where he explains how nature capital relations are temporally and locationally specific. So different people experience similar phenomenon in very different ways based on their combined social location and the inlay of capitalism. Creative destruction produces very uneven geographies that play to the needs and the preferences of some urban residents while literally burying the livelihoods and lived realities of others. In terms of the, of the Leslie Street Spit, the entire landform serves as a material record of the succession of the city's built environment through creative destruction. We find the base materials that originated hundreds of kilometers away, as Heidi will tell us in a moment, on the Oak Ridge's moraine and further afield. These minerals were transformed into materials that composed Toronto's built structures that were then in turn demolished and replaced in that cycle. The building materials were then deposited as fill to expand the city's southern boundary into the lake. Meanwhile, creating more urban development terrain for expanded capital accumulation, which in turn forms the substrate for the novel ecological assemblages that we then find at the spit. So back to Heidi. When Jenny and I started looking at the spit years ago now, um, what we thought we would do is sort of combine our different perspectives to come up with something like to try and make those connections that Jenny was just discussing. At the time I was in archeology span and now in cultural heritage. Um, and Jenny had all this amazing knowledge about the spit. So what we did was we took archeology, archeological methods and applied it to the spit to see if we could try and trace some of the material we were finding. So I think when you walk onto the spit, you see this landscape and the first thing you notice is the ecology. But if you go to the shoreline, you can see areas where that the rubble is eroding out of the landscape. And then if you just take a camera and walk around and you can take pictures of anything that has markings and those things can be traced back to locations. So a lot of our research was based on tracing back marked brick to specific aggregate sites. A lot of it came from the Don Valley Brickworks. Um, a lot of it came from Cooksville. The Jace Price Brickward is it's near um, Greenwood and Queen Street, I believe and other locations throughout Ontario. We also found, which was surprising, um, near the headlands, so like the 1964 zone, we found a lot of household materials. So a lot of the discourse, um, or earlier discourse about the Leslie Street Spit was that it was based on clean fill. So clean construction materials, just you know, the concrete, brick, rebar. But when we dig, dug into it and started looking very closely, we were finding teacups, um, food waste, so, so that's a long bone there. We found diapers, skipping ropes. So whole households, in other words, were demolished and put into the lake, which is fascinating. Um, the personal artifacts in particular, we tried to tie to certain demolition episodes in the city to try and figure out who is displaced, like who did this teacup belong to? Where did it come from? Um, the years 1964 and 1968 were, years of high demolition activity in the city. Um, so we found a couple neighborhoods where these materials could possibly come from. One of them is Alexandra Park, which is just south of Kensington Market. So uh, if you see under the 1964 photo, that building stock would look like Kensington Market. So a lot of the heritage buildings that we see in Kensington, it would have been a continuation of that street network and continuation of that built form. Um, and the archival photograph on the bottom there, you can see the rear of it looks like a maybe a second empire row of housing with the mansard roofs. Um, I love this photograph because there's actually people in it. So these are the photographs that were taken before this community was demolished. So you see children playing, there's babies in the background, there's laundry on that line. So you can just picture that household becoming this refuse that is at the spit. Another neighborhood that went through a high demolition period um, is where new city hall stands. 
Um, so this was referred to as the ward. And again, you can sort of see the, the original street layout and then it going through demolition and then the, the final built form and how quickly this happens, right? Like within eight years, you're raising an entire neighborhood. Um, and then again, the archival photograph on the bottom right gives you an idea of what that neighborhood would have looked like when you compare it to the modernist, like the really intense modern structure that is City Hall. It's a very, very big difference. I also just want to note that um, Timmins Martel has done some amazing archaeological work on this neighborhood. So if anybody is interested in reading more, um, the ward uncovered is a, a pretty incredible um, set of essays about this neighborhood. So if you visit the Leslie Street Spit, you're confronted with this ecological richness. It's a, it, you know, a, a, an accidental wilderness. It's, um, and that, that ecological ri richness of the Leslie Street Spit was unforeseen. It was just meant to be a dump, a place to dump to get rid of all this stuff and to expand the shoreline of the city so the city could develop further. Um, what we find is, it, you know, if you go down and visit there, it feels like indeterminate and unbounded possibilities. Anything is possible down there. It's there's no there's no um, car access. It's completely open and a sense of freedom. There are a lot of activities that happen there that don't happen anywhere else in the city. Um, you know, it's it's a really really interesting place. So the stage was set for ecological succession to proceed in really unexpected ways. And in so many ways, it's a living lab of what can be called novel ecosystems, ecosystems with no historical precedent. But it also raises a lot of really important questions, questions about whose buildings were devalued and annihilated to create this landform that's an ecological wonder now, whose histories are acknowledged or not acknowledged in the production of this and in the cycle of creative destruction. But it also raises really important questions around the ethics of creating habitat like this that attracts flora and fauna. Habitat that exposes animals to a lot of contaminants that come from Toronto Harbour, the concentration of those contaminants in the wetlands as the Keating Channel is dredged daily and dumped at the Leslie Street Spit. So in many ways, this is a perilous landscape feature as well. Um, and green spaces in this way, I, I guess the point that um, we're getting at is are, are really uh, fantastic ways of um, advancing historical erasure as well. So back over to you, Heidi. Yeah, we wanted to, to end by trying to connect the Leslie Street Spit with, with conservation and sort of tie some of these themes together. Um, and I think one of the things that really stands out to me is that, you know, the Leslie Street Spit in many ways is a very recent landscape. Um, it's very young, but I think it should be viewed as a cultural heritage landscape, kind of without question. Um, it has design and physical value. It has uniqueness about it and rich ecology. Um, it has very strong historical and associative value um, with agencies within the city of Toronto. And also it physically yields artifacts that give us a better understanding about the city and the history of the city. So understanding where those bricks come from, where that teacup could have come from. Um, sort of leads us back to those communities that were displaced and might have just been forgotten. So I think it's very important to consider historical associations of this landscape. And finally, it has contextual value um, for a lot of the reasons that Jenny has already cited, it being a globally significant bird area, it's an ESA, it's character defining part of the waterfront, and it's also very highly valued by the community. Um, and then trying to think forward, like how would we conserve this landscape? It's a tricky one, I was thinking about it. And a lot of the standard conservation approaches, which are preservation, rehabilitation, restoration, don't necessarily apply here because it is such a young and evolving landscape. But I think some of the big, the big lessons that in conservation do apply. So, you know, conserve the landscape without serious replacement or substantial alterations. Conserve changes that over time have become character defining elements. And I think this is a key one here where it is an evolving landscape. And until only recently, it was physically changing almost every day. So treating those changes as having value in themselves. I think a minimal interve intervention approach. So like we don't need to, to add buildings or trails or, you know, it, it kind of is 
already good. And like Jenny said, that sense of freedom that you get there, um, if you try and tame it too much, it'll disappear. And I think that sense of freedom is what is character defining here. Um, and then finally, you know, protect and stabilize it. A lot of these like sort of basic conservation tenants can be applied here in a way that I think would be brilliant and would just help to protect this landscape as time moves on. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm gonna pass, uh, pass the baton to Lena and Ron, um, who I think will complement this presentation um, in some very interesting ways. Hello, everybody. I'm just gonna give me a second to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can everybody see okay? Um, not quite. No, okay, give me one second. Can we see that now? Yep. Okay, cool. So hello everybody. Thank you to all the guests for being here today and thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here and be presenting on our work. Um, as Allison mentioned, my name is Lena and I'm here today with my colleague Ron and we'll be presenting our research on redevelopment, displacement and missing media narratives in Regent Park. So Regent Park is a neighborhood in Toronto's downtown east and it was originally constructed in the 1950s as a social housing development. Over time, many negative stereotypes and narratives emerged about the neighborhood, often characterizing it as blighted, crime-ridden, and dangerous. And for many decades, residents of the Regent Park neighborhood have been countering the narratives of stigmatization associated with the neighborhood as a whole and those who live in it. Um, it's currently the site of North America's largest public housing revitalization project, which started in 2006 and is soon to be entering uh, phases four and five of construction. I'm going to hand it off to Ron now. Sure. Thanks, Lena. Um, so the reason Lena and I started doing research on Regent Park is actually because we were working with Professor Aditi Mehta, who is at the Urban Studies Department in the University of Toronto. Um, unfortunately, uh, Professor Mehta can't be with us today, but uh, we're going to channel all the research that we've done with her. So in 2019, Professor Mehta started a brand new class at the University of Toronto. The class is a collaboration between Urban Studies students at the university and Region Park Focus, a multimedia community arts center in Region Park. The aim of this class is to create a setting for university students and Region Park youths to come together and learn from each other. Ultimately, we produced media projects about Region Park, its redevelopment, and the lived experiences of its residents. The inaugural 2019 class, which Elena and I were a part of, collaborated with the Diva Girls Group at uh, the center, which is a group of teenage Muslim women. And on the screen here, you see photos from that class. Our five teams produced a wide range of projects, including a video, a podcast, a zine, and more, all centering on different aspects of the redevelopment, and we'll be showing two of these projects in a moment. In 2020, the class shifted their focus toward thinking about faith, religion, and the built environment, and a whole new set of media projects were produced based on those themes. Um, next slide. Um, the design of this class draws from the principles of Youth Participatory Action Research, or YPAR for short. Um, just to give a bit of context, um, PAR is a research methodology that focuses on shifting the researcher research dynamic. Instead of an outside academic coming into Region Park and extracting information, participatory action research stresses that research is a collaborative mode of inquiry. Region Park residents are participants in the research process. We, the university students, are working with them, not on them. And specific to the notion of why PAR is youth participation. We are interested in what youths particularly have to say about the redevelopment and what it's like to grow up in the neighborhood undergoing such dramatic change. To work with youths as research partners is to recognize their role and contribution to the public sphere. And finally, uh, it is important to us that this class took media production as its final outcome. Producing work in the form of photography and podcasts and the like turns us away from traditional modes of knowledge production. Often in academia and community development, only particular forms of academic and professional research are considered quote unquote real knowledge, overlooking other ways of knowing and being in the world. Media production is a way of breaking through the barriers of professionalism 
allowing other forms of knowledge to be created and conveyed in more accessible ways. Uh, next slide. So now we'd like to show you two of these projects that were created as part of this class, um, namely the ones that Lena and I were a part of. So my team, uh, I was part of a team of five, three U of T students and two Regent Park residents. And we called ourselves the Space Jammers. Together, we created a satirical infomercial that questions the accessibility of Regent Park's new public spaces. Focusing on the aquatic center and athletic grounds, we raised the question of who these new facilities really serve and who the public is imagined to be. Um, and so can we just play a quick clip of the video? You were right about Regent Park. That's why right. I'm here to tell you about all the new and improved public spaces that we built as part of the Regent Park revitalization. So the Regent Park Aquatic Center, Regent Park Athletics Ground, as well as the upcoming Catholic School. We built this space so that we can foster social inclusion and ultimately to just build a stronger, better, and more diverse community. We heard your complaints back in July 1969 when you were complaining in Nathan Little Square because you didn't have a waiting room. But we're sick of it. And now we have consulted with the city and published the 2005 report on the strategy for the provision of community facilities. Now we finally got your poll, Grandma. Everyone gets to swim here, but especially the residents of Regent Park. Wait, what did you say? What type of Regent Park facilities? Oh my god, this guy. Do you live in Regent Park? Do you enjoy swimming? Well, you're going to have to line up at 3 a.m. Thank you for bearing with my um, terrible acting. Um, but anyway, so to contextualize this video, we made it um, not long after news had come out about the Aquatic Center and its inaccessibility, which the video itself kind of details. In 2019, it was found that only about 25% of registrants at the pool, uh, at the pool's programs were Regent Park residents. The creation of a new free aquatic center assumes that everyone in Regent Park has access to the facility, which conflates proximity and distance with public accessibility. In truth, the uneven socioeconomic opportunities distributed across neighborhoods means that a free pool doesn't necessarily benefit Regent Park residents. Instead, the residents are left competing with wealthier individuals and families from other regions to access a space supposedly built for the benefit of Regent Park. What we see here is that displacement does not necessarily happen in the form of physical relocation, though to be sure that happens when Regent Park residents move out and choose not to return after new condos are built. Through creating this video, we found that residents can be displaced from their own neighborhood while living in it, when they're precluded from accessing resources and facilities. It leaves us with a question that we began with, who are these public spaces built for? Regent Park is being redeveloped, but for whom? And so now I'll pass it to Lena to talk about her project. So like Ron, but in a team of Free U of T students, including myself, and one diva girl named Samira, we created a media project that focused on another local issue, which was displacement moving and social mixing in Regent Park. And for this project, we co-created a timeline that sought to tell the story of the revitalization over time through a multitude of perspectives. At this time, Regent Park had been undergoing revitalization for approximately 13 years and was changing from a 100% public housing community to a mixed use and socially mixed neighborhood, with only 25% um, public housing. So to start the, uh, the data gathering process, we interviewed Samira about her experiences being born and growing up in a neighborhood experiencing revitalization. And she was 13 at the time. So her experience of Regent Park was constantly changing as the built environment also constantly changed around her. We also included major neighborhood changes that specifically affected Samira and overall construction changes, as well as varying types of literature that spoke about Regent Park. And this included um, academic literature, news media, and even documentary films. 
In this project, we found that the way that Regent Park was talked about varied greatly depending on who was documenting the neighborhood and where it was being documented. Specifically, we noted that news media sources tended to speak about Regent Park using terms I referred to earlier, such as dangerous, crime-ridden, and blighted. So building on the timeline, I researched and co-wrote a separate piece for Spacing Magazine that did a comparative analysis between news media and film, sorry, and academic literature. In this piece, my co-writer Keisha and I spoke about the changing discourses and narratives associated with the neighborhood over time, noting that the city's effort to rebrand Regent Park from a neighborhood characterized by crime, danger, and blight um, by implementing this revitalization strategy had actually worked at the citywide scale, um, meaning that those that were reporting on Regent Park in the news media actually began to change the narratives that they used to report on the neighborhood over time. In our analysis of the literature, uh, the academic literature, we found that some of these discourses and narratives, however, um, that were used to speak about the neighborhood and its residents had actually remained, specifically among the influx of new residents to the neighborhood. So these stigmatizing narratives that persisted within the neighborhood contributed to what is known as the effective displacement or gentrification without displacement of Regent Park's original residents as the perceived benefits of social mix were not actually matching up with the results in practice. So the findings documented in this piece inspired the research that I conducted for my graduate thesis with Aditi as my um, supervisor. And specifically, I was curious about how media reporting varied among different neighborhoods, if at all, and how it contributed to the effective displacement and spatial dislocation of people in their communities. I was particularly interested in any differences that may occur in media reporting in neighborhoods that are currently undergoing redevelopment, particularly those that are demographically disparate. So I'll very briefly talk about that. Um, for this th thesis research, I examined the media portrayals of intensification focused redevelopment in Regent Park and Mervish Village, which is the site of the Honest Edge redevelopment. I also took to examine counter narratives to understand whether or not there were any missing stories from news media accounts of the respective redevelopment projects. And I was able to do this by conducting a main mainstream news media analysis and documentary film analysis. From this research, I gathered two main findings. The first one being that the mainstream media held vastly different tones when reporting on Regent Park and Mervish Village. In Regent Park, there was greater documentation of the positive aspects of redevelopment, including sociodemographic changes. While in Mervish, there was greater concern about the loss of sense of place that would occur from the loss of honest eds in particular. There was also a lot of memorialization and nostalgia, which wasn't as present in the Regent Park articles. Um, the second finding is that the documentary films made it clear that both Regent Park and Mervish Village had missing narratives from the mainstream news media. In the case of Regent Park, stories like broken elevators in the seniors building, making it inaccessible and raised a lot of concerns for the residents and also the problematic environmental design of the townhomes where doors are painted different colors for subsidized units and market rate units were stories that were left out of the mainstream media altogether. In the case of Mervish, discussions relating to affordable housing concerns in the new development, as well as the erasure of the black histories of the neighborhood were two concerns that were expressed in the films, but not in the mainstream news media. So the findings of my thesis research led me to conclude that the media plays a large role in maintaining the values, traditions, belief systems, and assumptions of dominant groups. And it can also act as a form of social control since it excludes certain groups from participating in community spaces, social roles, and specifically in storytelling, which is what the research and the community engaged learning course that Ron and I participated in was specifically about. So to tie it back to the projects we made with the Diva Girls, it's really important um, to allow people to document their own stories in their own communities. Um, and this is something that Regent Park Focus, the community organization that we partnered with has been working to do to destigmatize the neighborhood. But I believe that there should be larger, and I, Ron and Aditi and myself all believe that there should be larger institutional and systemic changes that will allow for community members to share their stories on large platforms and outlets like the mainstream news media. So this was just a little bit about all the work that has come out of this uh, community engaged learning course, but to learn more about ours and other projects, you're welcome to visit the website above and I'm happy to put it into the chat as well. Super great. Um, 
Yeah, the uh, Samira's story is the my first entry point. Um, I was really compelled by that piece and uh, it motivated me to reach out and make uh, and learn more about you both and your, your team and yeah, incredible presentation. Um, I'll pass it over to Murphy now. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to ACO for inviting me. Thank you to Allison uh, for organizing this and reaching out. Um, thank you to the panelists for sharing their work. I look forward to the conversation. Um, I'm going to try to come at this from a, a slightly different direction. So um, like Allison said, I'm Michelle Murphy. I'm a professor at U of T. Um, I'm also Métis from Winnipeg. And uh, you'll soon learn why all this matters. Um, so I wanted to take up Allison's prompt about what are the forces which manipulate and displace materials and communities from sites? And maybe kind of push back on the assumption that when there is disruption, displacement of um, material forms, that the displacement of communities is, is um, inevitable. And so I really want to talk about the endurance of Indigenous presence on land in the face of incredible disruption. So the work that I do is mostly about Ontario's chemical valley. And this is where some 40% of Canada's petrochemicals are refined. And um, the work that I do is mostly about the relationship between colonialism, um, pollution and infrastructure in uh, chemical valley. And this work, is done uh, at this lab, um, the uh, Environmental Data Justice Lab at the Technical Science Research Unit. And this is a indigenous led, indigenous majority lab that involves um, both indigenous students, myself, but also indigenous community members from Amjanong First Nation on whom their land a Chemical Valley uh, exists. And so our work um, draws from this kind of tradition, which is the tradition of Indigenous science and technology studies. And, you know, the university or researchers or government studies um, tend to take the, the approach of, like, studying and displacement by studying, like, its effects on Indigenous people, for example. And this is not at all what our lab's about. Our lab is, like, Indigenous people studying, like, settler colonial infrastructures. Right, so we're really turning the lens around and saying, you know, we are Indigenous researchers, community members and academics who are together coming to understand how settler colonial works in a built environment and the relationship between colonialism and infrastructures. So on the one hand, what we're interested in these extensive relations, these extensive infrastructures that make up environmental violence in Chemical Valley. And on the other hand, we're really invested, we're com absolutely committed to decolonial relations to land in Chemical Valley. What does that mean? That means affirming Indigenous sovereignty. That means understanding the land body relations at work, even in a polluted site. It means bringing Indigenous epistemologies and values to the, to the study of infrastructure and so on. So we're doing these two things at the same time, studying chemical valley for its infrastructure and built worlds, and then kind of um, trying to affirm an, another view. So part, one of the questions that we asked, so Chemical Valley is um, a place where there's a lot of pollution. Um, there's 57 some facilities, uh, petrochemical facilities, and uh, a kind of typical refinery in, in Chemical Valley will produce something like 50 to 60 times the amount of pollutants a refinery in the United States has produced. The, um, the levels of pollution in Chemical Valley are extraordinary. And not only are they extraordinary, but I, I'm really um, sad and, and, and even enraged to say that during COVID, when Ontario um, decided that it was going to suspend environmental regulation, uh, in Ontario, saying it was too hard to do environmental relation during COVID, uh, it's gotten even worse. So 
the way that, you know, sometimes the government or our science wants us to understand the pollution and chemical values, to like, you know, measure a chemical or a molecule and look at like, you know, try to like capture a sample in a moment in the air and see if like a pollution event is happening. But if you're in Kamjanong or Chemical Valley, you are surrounded on all sides by pollution. You do not need uh, a measure of a chemical to understand that this is an incredible disruption to land. So, uh, and to bodies. And so one of the questions that we want to ask is like, where does pollution end and begin? Why should we look at pollution in terms of like a chemical pollutant? For example, can we look at the infrastructures and the responsibilities and the networks? And this kind of relates to Allison's opening comments. Like, can we trace the extensiveness of, of this pollution in Chemical Valley? So um, we could say Chemical Valley is a heritage site because it was, um, it's there because it was proximate to the world's first commercial oil field in the 1850s. We don't really talk about this in Ontario, but Ontario is like in Pennsylvania, are the site of the world's oldest commercial oil fields. And because of that is also the site of some of the world's oldest refineries. So this is an image of the Imperial Oil Refinery. So if the, if the commercial oil field started in 1850, that's before Canada even existed, right? And uh, the Imperial Oil Refinery is dated to around, in its earliest form, as the Dominion Refinery to around 1870. So this is basically Canadian Confederation. So the relationship between Chemical Valley and the history of, and its infrastructure, the history of colonialism in Canada is like completely in concert. Um, when we're talking about Chemical Valley, we're talking about um, uh, something just south of Sarnia, Ontario. It's on the St. Clair River, which stretches from uh, Lake Erie, uh, no, sorry, Lake Huron down to Lake Erie and kind of turns into the Detroit River. And uh, why I like to show this NASA uh, image is to give, to remind us here, you know, in Toronto, I know many of us on this call or this webinar from Toronto, um, that this is the planet's largest collection of surface fresh water. This is where some 21% of the Earth's fresh water gathers. These great lakes are an in incredible bodies of water. And so that this chemical valley is um, on these lakes. Um, it's on the Canadian side of this river. On the other side is the United States. If we go south on the river, we, we start at the top with Chemical Valley, we go on the south to Detroit. So this little bit of the lake is kind of an important place where fossil fuel capitalism was born, where it was invented, where the infrastructures were made from 1850s until, this, until today. When we think about that, kind of rust belt history on the, on the US side and the ongoingness of Chemical Valley. We have whole histories of material infrastructural making as well as um, destruction. So um, our lab has in particular been quite obsessed with the Imperial Oil Refinery. It's the, the biggest polluter in Chemical Valley. It's the oldest existing, we think we're operating refinery in the world. And you can see the green here, this is Amjanong First Nation, and it's surrounded on all sides by Chemical Valley. Um, and when I say all sides, I don't mean all sides just on the land. Underneath it are literally hundreds of pipelines. Um, above it is, um, the air is uh, full of plumes, as you'll see in some images. And below it are these, um, but the earth itself is, has, is, has a, a layer of salt for which then um, these kind of brine is used to make salt caverns since about 1910. And so there's hundreds of caverns underneath here for which the um, waste of petrochemical capitalism has been put in, mostly in eras of unregulation since 1910. So it's, on, it's below, above, to the side, all around. Here on the, on the right, you can see um, uh, you know, Anjanal First Nation now is like a reserve surrounded by Chemical Valley. But if we look at its traditional territory, we can understand that Anjanal was on both sides of the river, right? The U.S. side, the Canadian side extended all the way between the two lakes. That right? was part of the Three Fire uh, Ojibwe Confederacy. And we might then also just think 
Amgenong First Nation is a community that's been dealing with petrochemical um, capitalism longer than almost any other community on earth, right? And it's still there, right? It's not been displaced. So how do we understand then the wisdoms, the knowledges, the um, histories, right, of Chemical Valley if we start with Amgenong? So um, just to give you a little sense of things that happen in Chemical Valley, this is a flare from 2017 at the Imperial Oil uh, Refinery. It, it um, you know, is something you can capture on a camera um, because it was, you know, so obvious. A lot of pollution events is hard to capture on a camera. Um, this is, you know, the information that's provided to the community. Um, a small grass fire, no emissions detected, no injuries. This is very typical. Like literally almost every other day, there's something an event, a spill, an accident. And the, the, actually the reports have gotten now to like one sentence. So I'll just say something like unit process disrupted. But there's no information provided by the company or the state about what's going on. Even you can see it and feel it. And so we call this a kind of um, permission to pollute colonialism, right? It's an ongoing situation of um, disruption in Amjadong First Nation on this particular territory. You can look at this history, you know, there's a lot of museums and heritage around this oil, a pride around this oil history because of the oil field, because of the, 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 um, the age of the refinery. But we can turn our heads and look at it from an anti-colonial perspective and see, you know, that the refinery came with the mission, came with the surveyors, came with the railroad, all at the same time, right? All this infrastructure kind of was part of the bringing of colonialism to this region. Um, and when we look at the Imperial Oil Refinery, which is so big, we can even see parts of it that date back for decades and decades. Like you can find parts that are from the 1920s and so on. So it's quite fascinating. And you know, Chemical Valley is not just about these companies, like companies like Imperial Oil, but it's been a state and national project. It used to be on the $10 bill, right? Really celebrated as part of Canadian heritage. If we wanna, I think, think critically about this, we have to think about in Canada how colonialism works in a company and state relation, right? It's not just imperial oil and the government kind of giving a permission to pollute system where it doesn't really monitor the pollution, but it, it goes back to our very understanding of Canada. How Canada was born of the Hudson's Bay, right around the same time that the imperial oil refinery was founded. That whole history of extraction, we can look at these images, I think, from Ken, Monkman um, to think about, um, you know, Canada started as a company state relation with like collecting the timber and, and collecting the fur and killing the beavers and so on. And then can we see a continuity to today, right, in this company state relation in relationship to Indigenous land defense, right, and what gets criminalized and what kind of displacements are made legal and what is made, what kind of land defense is made illegal, right? And so there's a whole history. I'm giving you like the shorthand here. Um, but it goes even, you know, deeper than that or wider than that. Imperial oil was bought in the late 19th century by Standard Oil, then the world's biggest oil company. Today, it's ExxonMobil, one of the biggest, like, top four uh, companies. Um, and it's part of a whole, we could say, continental fossil fuel um, infrastructure, right? You can look at the pipelines, you can look at the international shipping channels, you can look at the railroads and so on. So it's, it is not just local, it spreads, you know? So when we think about displacement, like what's being displaced, it's a lot of like earth and bitumen from like particular territories being pulled from the ground, being brought into built infrastructures that go back sometimes to the forties, the sixties, these pipelines, it pulls them over to, to um, Chemical Valley to be made into, you know, commercial products. And here's a little sense of like some of the pipelines that meet in, in Chemical Valley. So many of them and the transit points are named after and in, using indigenous names, which always kind of like is this weird eruption of like the acknowledgement of this colonial project as part of this infrastructure of material displacement. And then we can look at this kind of thing. So it's not just a company like Standard Oil. But when we look at these kind of historic relations, yes, we have Imperial Oil, it's owned by Standard Oil, but then Imperial Oil kind of got together with consumer gas 
which is a Toronto company and hope to make Enbridge, right? Which built that whole huge, like the world's biggest pipeline network. And then uh, consumer gas was owned, right? By James Lawson, the same person who started Dominion Bank, which became D D TD Bank, which funds the pipelines and so on. So there's a whole corporate kinship that goes into this material displacement. So if we think about like the displacements of Chemical Valley and what's going on there, we have to then go all the way to downtown Toronto. We have to look at TD. We have to look at downtown Toronto as a site of finance capital and an important place globally for the funding of, dis of extraction around the world, right? There's a reason why TD Bank is a global target for divestment funds. And so we can then begin to think about like these kind of reports like from Indigenous Environmental Network that tries to show that the creation of this displacement of land into pollution and its concentration in particular indigenous or black or poor communities is actually funded by kind of a handful of banks, right? So we can connect up these downtowns to what's happening in these places. And then we can also think about, you know, we only have so many companies actually that are responsible for um, this concentrated pollution. I mean, we get really specific about the responsibilities for this disruption to land and life and so on. Um, and so thinking about that and kind of getting to that to the end of my talk, um, Toronto is the home to some 17 refineries. Each of these refineries is on Indigenous land. Each of these refineries, so this is a map, of, you know, the, the live version of that, we can go on each of these refineries and understand what is the indigenous jurisdiction that this refinery is on and what is it responsible to? You know, if we understand that in Chemical Valley is there, but so is Amgenong. Amgenong was there before Chemical Valley, it's gonna be there after. And there's land body relations that yes, are disrupted, but they are enduring. So we are interested in things, oh, I don't know how to miss that here, but we're interested in thinking about that the land of chemical, of Anjanong, the land that is disrupted by chemical value, in fact, our bodies that are disrupted is still sacred, right? It's persistent. It's still to be loved. It's still to be cared for. Displacement is resisted. Um, even from toxic spaces, we will be beautiful and we will continue to grow. We will not leave, we will stay. Um, and so, you know, things like this is kind of what I think about. What is, what is the resistance to displacement looks like? It looks like these kind of struggles, like no pipelines on indigenous land, right? That's a disruption against the narrative that communities are inevitably displaced. And then I like this. Yeah, there's 17 existing refineries. There's way more closed refineries in Canada than there are open ones if we look at the history. So that's kind of exciting to me. The other refinery that's the same age as Imperial Oil, which was in uh, Pennsylvania, the other kind of tied for the oldest from also 1870, blew up in 2019 and is now shut, right? So what's gonna, what's gonna go away, right? What's gonna be displaced? What's gonna be demolished? Right? Is it Amgenal? Is it indigenous presence? Um, here around the same time, one of the towers at the Imperial uh, facility just fell over on its own accord. And you know, we're like almost like cheering. Like, yes, it's a kind of like scary moment, but at the same time, it's like the refinery itself wants to go. You know, what's going to fall? What's going to come apart? What's going to be displaced? And then I just want to end on this thought. Okay. Well, if we want to actually wrestle with the, the legacy of settler colonialism and displacement, right? Where do we start if we want to say that indigenous sovereignty has not been displaced, but is still present? It's present in Chemical Valley and it's present in Toronto, right? And I think the place to start is with um, things like this, um, the Dish of One Soon Wampum Treaty, which you probably, you know, have heard a bit about, but the, it's like a pre-colonial agreement between Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people about how to live on these amazing waters together, right? Without destroying one another. And I love this um, art piece by Ogama Makana, um, which then says like, even in Parkdale, even in Chemical Valley, and it says in Anishinaabe Moan, 
if you want to know where to start, you start here, right? You start with this value about how do you live peaceably in this place and um, work against the, um, the supposed um, obviousness of Indigenous erasure and displacement. So thank you, everybody. I look forward to chatting. Thank you, Murphy um, McGwitch. It's that, uh, yeah, what a beautiful way and uh, a super engaging way to draw us all in um, to this moment and to this um, to this conversation. Uh, so interesting to think about um, Jenny and Heidi's sort of um, initial prompt and thinking about sort of this landscape that is created and moving um, to Lena and, and Ron's um, sort of challenge uh, that displacement does not um, necessarily even occur in geographic space, but occurs um, in emotional space um, in media. And then for Murphy to, for you to um, uh, supply us with such rich, um, uh, uh, media and um, sort of artistic representations and uh, indeed challenge the notion of displacement and um, think about, um, I really liked the uh, notion of what is being displaced into communities and the way and sort of the way that um, this entire conversation on displacement sort of blurs, blurs so many lines or is about blurred lines. Um, about uh, sort of bodies, geographies, um, materials, and space, um, and how we define those things. So um, I wanted to uh, sort of launch this next little segment um, as a uh, as a, a chance for us to sort of ask questions of one another. Um, if you if you did indeed um, generate any questions um, from each other's presentations, um, thought it would be interesting to, to, to go about it that way. Um, not sure if anybody wants to start right off the bat. Go ahead, Jenny. Yeah, fascinating. Like the, the other two presentations were yeah, really, really, really great. Thank you so much for sharing all that. Um, Murphy, could you tell us a little bit about the other types of life forms that have perhaps thrived as well? Um, you know, in these types of spaces, there are often really creative things happening as well. It's very true. Um, you know, Anjanong is uh, famous for having lots of snakes. Mm. very snakeful um, mm -hmm. uh, but of course you know um, fish birds mm -hmm. plants and people have all been very disrupted by 150 more than 150 years of ongoing chronic pollution mm -hmm. and that affects the um, uh, just the manifestation of life and um, so many of the industrial pollutants are actually endocrine disrupting chemicals. So it's very disrupted to community continuity, to um, things like um, genital development, uh, fertility and so on across animal forms and human life. Um, but it's kind of interesting, like I've been taken by the fact that it is a highly disrupted space. There's lots of quote invasive species and I've been always you know, kind of like charmed by the beings who can just totally thrive in highly toxic spaces. So there's this um, fish called the round goby that is um, super successful. It loves like Hamilton Harbor. Mm. And like it loves the most like toxic places in the, in the lower Great Lakes. And it like makes nests in the garbage. And um, it's not particularly disrupted as far as a, a species goes in relation to other uh, species. Um, but it's also its body itself is very affected by toxic chemicals. And so it has a lot of like um, gender um, 
multiplicity because of the effects of chemicals, including like in terms of genital shape, including in terms of behavior, but it nonetheless thrives. And so there's something like really beautiful up to me about like the story of the round goby, which is like, um, you know, uh, a kind of um, thriving in the face of um, disruption, of bodily disruption, and a kind of way that, um, you know, beings coming, even, you know, Anishinaabe people like migrated to this place. Like even, you know, I'm not from this place, I'm from Winnipeg. Um, and so this kind of like process of being in disruption together can um, be very beautiful, even as it's super painful. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Lana, go ahead, jump right in. Yeah, I guess so kind of on the same type of question as well, also for you, Murphy. Um, so I'm familiar with some of your work because we've read it in a few of my classes in university, um, specifically in a course called Violence and Security. And um, I pulled up just a something that I recalled from one of your pieces, which is just the quote that the possible role of past exposures to endocrine disrupting chemicals in the lives not born among the Amgenon is difficult to prove. Nearby Sarnia shows no such change in sex ratio. So this always brought up the question for me about who is conducting research and who it's actually funded by. So um, I think there's like a different type of displacement, which is also the lives not born that you talk about in this piece and that you reference in terms of reproduction. So I just, I wonder if you have any insights regarding this particularly, and also just who funds research in general, who's funding this research that says there's no such sex changes in nearby Sarnia. Um, because as I've learned being in academia, who funds research often can have an impact on the results. So I've always been curious about that. And since I have the opportunity to ask now, I thought I would. Yeah, it, I mean, it goes very deep. Almost all of the monitoring um, and the research is funded by the government. Um, and lots of it, and particularly the monitoring, is funded by the government, but done by industry. So it's a very tricky situation in terms of like the knowledges that are produced about what happens in Chemical Valley, what happens in like, you know, places of intensive um, environmental disruption, any place in Canada. Um, and you're exactly right. Like that's why I loved like your and Ron's uh, work. And the question, which I think like exemplifies exactly about like how the questions change, right? If you're like, if they're driven by the values and, and curiosities and needs of community members. So, you know, what's our habit? Our habit is to study communities and how they've been hurt in order to show that violence has happened as opposed to collaborate with community members to show um, a kind of desire-based project about like how they would like their worlds to be. And I think you and Ron really both did that nicely. Um, and so that's not so much about funding as like kind of like who's setting the question as well. I mean, in the end our lab is funded by the Canadian government as well. You know, we get shirt funding all the time. Um, but it really matters that we start with Anjanong and Anjanong community members and they are the people defining the research and how Chemical Valley is studied. Thank you for sharing. Um, I had a practical question, I think, which can apply to anybody. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, talk of displaced communities um, whether that's like not spatially, but like within the community and not having access to resources. Um, how do you think, like what would be the best way to engage with or consult with those communities for like smaller projects, right? Like I'm not talking like big research projects, just like part of my own research that I do day to day is often very site specific. You know, we do quick checks with certain agencies, like what would be the best way to reach out and get these perspectives, not, not for large scale research projects, but for like small things, like, is there, you know, points of contact or like just based on your experience, what would your advice be there? 
I'm happy to answer a little bit of our process. Um, it's actually been quite difficult for us because everything has to be approved by the university before we actually do anything. And specifically because we are working with youth, it presents a very particular challenge. But in general, I believe that any sort of community organizing is the most beneficial way to get into a community, but not showing up the very first day and being like, these are my questions. This is what I need to know. It's always starting to show up and making sure that you build relationships with people, making sure that as researchers, we go in as listeners, active listeners, and not like reactive people. Um, I think that that is the very first step at building trust, which then can lead to very effective uh, relationship building and collaborating in the research process. But I, I will say like working with the Diva Girls has been very informative for us because it was something that really required building that trust. And for both Ron and I, it was very hard to leave our class after three short months and then say, oh, we're done, course completed, never have to show up again, um, which is why we're still involved in this course. So it's definitely not something that can happen in our case overnight, but I think it's about building relationships and bringing those relationships into the work that we're doing um, and have it inform part of the research that we do. That's great advice. Thanks. I wonder if there's any also um, insights that sort of come from, that can be informed by consulting, or I'm really interested in the, in the notion of consulting with sort of the non-human realm um, and as a, a really important sort of like actor and voice um, and the ways that that happens is so requires such a different kind of sensitivity. Um, like how do you ask the birds and the sort of the shoreline how they feel um, and the way that you know the question of asking in a supposedly inanimate um, or sort of uh, <laughs> different species uh, these questions uh, opens up another sort of creative tingling um, or sensitivity that might um, reveal something different um, that might come from a, a mode of observation that um, or a mode of listening that would not happen um, if you were to think about it as a like as a as a, ex a communication exchange with with humans it's, that's my input or thinking just from what I'm absorbing of um, Ron and uh, Murphy but Ron go ahead sure I'll, I'll just be quick about this um but yeah I think that's a really good point and I jot down my notes as I was listening to Jenny and Heidi talk like I love the emphasis on thinking about multi-species relationality and thinking about displacement as not being a strictly human phenomenon and, and thinking about like non-human beings. But Alison, as you were bringing that up about how do we communicate with um, other species, I was reminded of something uh, an, a professor of mine once told me, which was when we, if in a hypothetical scenario, when we ask a tr tree, how do I tell you I'm sorry? Are you, actu are you actually caring about the tree or are you caring about your own guilt and being able to apologize? And being having the other tell you you're being forgiven like mm -hmm. there's a very fine line between actually being sorry and simply wanting to be forgiven and then moving on um so that was the the thought that came into my head thank you um i want to make sure that we address at least a few of the um questions that are coming up in the chat um uh, juliet have you been able to select one or two Yes, absolutely. I see that uh, some of our panelists are, are multi-talented, great speakers, and addressing some of the chat questions as we go. Um, so I will kind of jump to one. I mean, Jennifer has just answered one, but I think uh, David and Jane asked questions that I'm going to kind of uh, group together. So David was asking about how much of the latest uh, Tommy Thompson plan has been implemented, and then Jane 
commented on um, or was asking about the impact on the ecosystem that the chemicals and the materials that have been dumped into the water, what that has had on uh, the ecosystems of the birds, fish, reptiles, and plants. If uh, Heidi and Jen, you want to talk to that? Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, we didn't really get it to go in too, too much detail about the um, array of actors that have been active here, but the spit was initially the Tor Toronto Port Authority. So it was uh, simply infrastructure at the beginning. Um, and it wasn't until the 70s that Toronto Region Conservation Authority got involved and then 95, I put it in the chat there, 95 when they, uh, the plan was launched and then it involved in um, habitat creation, what it's called um, there. But it's, um, you know, the, this, the spit was initially designed to protect the harbour in anticipation of, um, of um, uh, a shipping industry. So, you know, we need a, a deep protected harbor. We need to, you know, build something that will stop the wave action from hitting the harbor. Um, let's build the, let, let's get rid of this, the construction waste at the same time. So that was the initial conception of it. Um, but it's also part of, and this links to Murphy's presentation, the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement and some of the, um, kind of inverted logic of how you keep places, places safe. Um, how you contain toxicity and the false boundaries that exist and the, 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 how that actually leads to a concentration of damage that are experienced by very specific people and animals and in very specific places. And that's what we see on the Leslie Street spit. Every single day, the dredgeate from the Toronto Harbor is shipped out to the spit and dumped because of the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I'm, I don't know the details in um, Chemical Valley, but I'm assuming there are like strict regulations around keeping the pollution in place and containing it in a concentrated manner. So, I mean, those are major concerns. You know, I, I, I sort of mentioned, what are the ethics of creating this beautiful habitat that attracts stunning wildlife and becomes like an emblem of progress something to be proud of and attract, you know, uh, a growing financial sector and, you know, new condos all along the port lands. What are the ethics of creating that space when we are on a daily basis recontaminating it and attracting wildlife to toxic spaces? Um, I'll just leave it at that, yeah. Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have a question from someone named Sarah who's asking if any of the panelists have any comments on the intersection of displacement and settler colonial resource preservation. It's a big one. <laughs> I feel like in some ways that was um, touched on uh, through a lot of the, a lot of the presentations. Um, and maybe I'll let that linger. Yeah. I mean, there, there is this like the heritage kind of projects in around Chemical Valley are like around Petrolia, for example, oil springs and like memorialization of the emergence of, um, you know, the oil industry that comes out of there and, and all of that is is funded as as heritage work and so I, what I love about all these kind of presentations and I think like probably this whole series is like kind of troubling this kind of question of of heritage and like you know what Jennifer was saying like a concentrated toxicity in particular areas of Leslie Spit is heritage. Mm -hmm. Right, so like uh, the kind of wrestling with set the colonial is to understand that the, it's not about just preserving like the beautiful parts, but it's also like the responsibilities of wrestling with like heritage that is harmful and ugly and hurtful and ongoing. And so that's like an interesting conversation, I think, to have around um, heritage. I appreciate that it's happening right here. Me too. I appreciate all of you for being able to articulate that in so many different ways and, and share and be able to build such a um, such a 
like a loud and, and vibrant um, picture of this sort of like beautiful dissonance um, that like we all inhabit. And I think that's the intent certainly um, of this series is to sort of, um, yeah, describe as Lena and, and Ron did the sort of, there, that there is no sort of, you know, dom or even in, amidst maybe a dominant voice, there are so many missing and to call, um, call into question what those missing voices are as as Jenny and Heidi did in, in sort of the, the um, portrait of the spit um, and to and to offer some some inspiration but also some uh, some like a little bit more uh, energy into the the quest to um, to raise those voices up um, in and in, in sort of our everyday environments and, and in the sort of the, the conversation around heritage. Um, yeah, so, uh, so grateful for for you all. Um, I feel like I was going to say something really brilliant, but <laughs> now I'm just going to um, sort of uh, ease our way into the ending of this presentation um, by thanking everyone for participating and for sharing. Um, this will be up on the some YouTube somewhere <laughs> at some point and you'll all hear and see about it. Thanks for your contributions in the chat and the questions. Um, yeah, and, and have a have a lovely evening. And uh, yeah, take take care. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks so much. Good night. Right. Thank you.